Welcome to Talk South Asian to Me. My name is Michelle. And my name is Anusha. Tune in every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central and hear us react to each other's stories about mental health and growing up in different South Asian households. And remember, this podcast is not therapy. Engage with what feels entertaining and resonates with you and leave what doesn't. All righty, let's get started with today's podcast. We're up to letter P. <laughs> Can you believe wow. that? <laughs> letter P for this episode. That's crazy. I know. Okay, so I want you to do the letter P reveal because, I mean, okay. come on, I got to let you do it. So drum okay. roll, what I'm is ready. letter P? <laughs> letter P is dun, 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 people pleasing, people pleaser. <laughs> Our big, favorite topic. Big, big, <laughs> yep. Our favorite. I feel like I've mentioned people pleasing in probably every single episode that we've done so I far. I was literally thinking the same thing. I feel like yeah. one of us needs to go back and like do a count. Or if anyone's listening, yes. go back and do a count. Yes. It's like interconnected to everything in my opinion. <laughs> we'll dig into it today. I think so. Oh, yes. yeah. I can't wait. I'm so excited. I have so much in stock yes, for you. Me too. I'm excited. <laughs> okay. So I thought today, like usual – I would break down a little bit of like the therapeutic component, you know, the concepts, the definition, the origin story, and then we'll transition to how it shows up in like our South Asian communities. Sound good? Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Let's get into it then. So what is people pleasing? You know, we talk about people pleasing all the time, as you said, probably every episode, but like, what Mm -hmm. is it really? So to define it. People pleasing is when we frequently over prioritize everybody else's needs and wants above our own just yes. so that we can be liked and accepted by them. So, does that kind of like resonate yes. with you? You kind of agree with yes. that? Yeah. Over prioritizing, like sacrificing your own needs and wants. That's all bread and butter of people pleasing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. And yes. like, here's the thing, right? Like, Like I say, probably in every other episode, everything is kind of on a spectrum. So even people pleasing is on a spectrum. I would say people pleasing is a very normal human thing to do because we all have an innate desire, a drive that's like evolutionary drive, right? To be liked, to belong. You know, we it's an adaptive mechanism that has existed since way back Mm -hmm. when. So Mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with people pleasing on its own when it's healthy, but that's the thing. It has to be healthy. You don't want to be too on the opposite end of that spectrum, like not people pleasing at all, like not trying to compromise, not trying to care about people. You don't want to be on the other end where you're like people pleasing too much and over focused on other, but uh, on other people and like sacrificing yourself. Yeah. Like a a healthy medium. Healthy medium. I like that you said it's a spectrum because- you know, people, we like, you know, someone who like has a career that is, is all about like serving others or people pleasing, mm-hmm. right? Like you have to do the healthy amount versus yeah. like, you know, not sacrificing your own needs, whether that's like, you know, since I'm talking about career, like workplace, like not eating your own lunch or not yeah. taking your own breaks just because you want to yeah. please the people that you're working with. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah, I like that you say example. it's a spectrum because, yeah, because Sometimes when I hear the words people pleasing, I just think like completely negative because that's what I've like read about, watched videos yeah. about. Re- I think it's important to remember that there's healthy mm-hmm. people pleasing too. So I like that you pointed that Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Yeah. And you will probably continue to hear me talk about spectrums in every episode. So here we go. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so to talk a little bit about like its origin story, right? Like where does this people pleasing come from other than, you know, what I already said, like it is a very evolutionarily adaptive mechanism, you know, thing yes. back, 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 back way when, like when there were tribes and everything, right? You wanted to be a part of a tribe or you risk dying alone, eaten by a tiger mm-hmm. somewhere. <laughs> you were yeah. safer if you were in a tribe. So you needed to people please. You needed to be nice. You need to be accepted and liked by people so that your survival you know, rate and your skill set yeah. would be a little higher. But right. other than that, like, where else does this really originate from, right? So I read an article by um, Mind Body Green, which is a pretty popular like website. Um, mm-hmm. And the author was Maria Sosa, who is a marriage and family therapist. Okay. And I really like what she had to say. She said that, and this is something I've actually heard a lot of people say before. I don't know who 
maybe came up with it, but the quote was, people pleasers were once parent pleasers and still might be. Mm. <laughs> I know what that's saying. People pleasers <laughs> were once parent pleasers and still might be. Might be. And like we talk about with a lot of different things, there's a reason that, you know, we look backwards into our childhood, right? Because that's where we learned things as kids. And so she kind of goes on to say that um, basically people pleasing is like a coping mechanism in yeah. order to connect with a parental figure who may only provide love under certain circumstances, mm -hmm. a.k.a authoritarian parenting style you know which if you'll remember was all about like obedience discipline yes. um where mistakes weren't really tolerated they were punished and so basically the idea is to avoid this punishment and receive some sort of love or care the kids might kind of internalize that they need to be perfect they need to follow the rules and that every do everything in their power to please their caregivers and then another piece of this article also talked about how like Maybe growing up in a family that avoided conflicts or maybe even had like too much conflicts can also bring out this people pleasing tendencies. You know, on the one hand, not having any conflicts, even healthy conflicts, you kind of learn to like tiptoe around each other. Conflicts are bad. But on the yeah. other hand, if you have too many conflicts, then you can also, you know, think like, we're always fighting. I need to be the peacemaker. I don't want to ruffle feathers and start a yet another fight. Yeah. So it can also kind of start on either ends of those spectrums, this people-pleasing behavior, right? Mm -hmm. That makes yeah. sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, and some other things that I picked up on, not from this article, but just in general, um, like from my experience is fear of rejection, right? Criticism mm -hmm. or punishment, that kind of fear of rejection can really pull our desire to people-please. Yes. Um, and I was part of a conversation a long time ago and we were talking I was talking with another therapist and we were talking about how experiencing discrimination or exclusion can also bring about like people pleasing behaviors, right? Because you just mm -hmm. want to fly under the radar. You just don't want to ruffle feathers, right? Um, yeah. But the important thing to remember here as we talk about all of these things, like, oh, yeah, this came from childhood and like this was probably why. As we talk about all these things, I think it's important to recognize that just because that might have worked for us when we were young, because it was a survival mechanism, it helped us feel loved, yeah. it helped us feel cared for. It, it served us back then. It really did. Right. But the thing yeah. is, it might and it probably isn't serving you as an adult. Yes. Yeah. I agree. Um, so anything like surprise you in like the origin story or did you kind of feel like, yeah, that makes sense? Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think fear of rejection, parent pleasing, leading to becoming a people pleaser later in life. That makes sense to me. I think the fear of rejection, but fear of abandonment too, right? Like mm -hmm. you're people pleasing because um, you don't want others to leave you. Or re yeah. like reject you because maybe that was yeah. reinforced when you were young. Their love yeah. for you was mm -hmm. maybe conditional, um, mm -hmm. and so when people pleasing would occur, you would get that conditional love and care. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Although I, I kind of see it as fear of abandonment. I also feel like is maybe an umbrella of fear of rejection, right? Because if you're abandoned, mm, yeah. I imagine you'd feel very rejected too. But yeah, that's yeah, a good point. For sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's talk for a moment about signs of people pleasers. You know, I'm sure everybody's like, am I a people pleaser? Am I one? <laughs> let's talk <laughs> about that. So typically people pleasers um, signature moves are the following. One, being overly agreeable, being yes. very conflict averse, perhaps being too much of a perfectionist or high achieving, okay. having difficulty saying no, having mm -hmm. difficulty setting and enforcing boundaries, often on edge and anxious, stressed or overwhelmed, thinking someone will be upset with you, maybe mm -hmm. like more passive aggressive kind of uh, communication style, definitely prone to resentment. Mm -hmm. mm, perhaps even like being hasty in taking blame or taking responsibility for other people's feelings. 
Yeah. And the last two were having trouble being like true to your beliefs and sticking to what was right for you, what you want. And the last one um, is guilt, having a lot mm. of it. Anytime you yeah. try to do what's what you want. Yeah. Yeah. So these, most of these I picked up from um, an article by Psych Central um, and the okay. author was Matthew Boland. He's a psychologist. Okay. And I feel like a lot of these are things that we've definitely talked about too throughout most of our yes. podcasts, you know. Yes. Um, the resentment, the conflict mm -hmm. over the perfectionist, not being able to say no, the boundaries, the guilt. Was there anything else that you can think of maybe from your experience or just things that, you know, you know about people pleasing that might or could be added to this? Or does this I feel pretty comprehensive? You, no, I think you, it was pretty comprehensive. Like you covered it all that I could think of. Mm -hmm. um, I think overthinking, I don't know if you mentioned that or not. Maybe mm. overwhelmed or overthinking might be part of it yeah. as well. Like yeah. you're all constantly thinking about the situation. Like what if you said something differently or you did something differently? Absolutely. I think that might be related to people-pleasing tendencies. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that covers it all. It's a lot. Um, guilt was yeah. something that I think is very directly related, but I didn't think of it. If, I, if you had asked me for the list, I would have probably listed all the others, but not guilt. But mm. it makes sense. Like the yeah. Guilt. And – to be honest, like I didn't see that listed either anywhere else. Like when I was doing my research and like jotting things down, this was something that I added because, okay. you know, it's definitely something personally that I've experienced being a people pleaser is like having a really, really like overly strong guilt, but also mm -hmm. things that I see like in clients all the time, you know, whether they can label it as guilt or not, it usually is guilt that stops them, um, you know, from being assertive from yeah. choosing what they want from quote unquote being selfish. Yes. The guilt just kind of steps in and is like, no, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we talked about what is people pleasing? How do you identify if you have it? Let's talk about the most important part, the solution piece. How do you stop it? So okay. I have a long list of how to stop people pleasing and just kind of, see if what like resonates with you what you've tried or if you have anything to add okay 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 here we go long list buckle in <laughs> ready um one thing was realize that you have a choice you know sometimes when we people mm -hmm. please it can feel like i have no choice i have to do this i should be doing this and i think that one was kind of an underrated tip i suppose we can call it but i i think that's actually a really important one that you do have a choice yes um and then identify what your priorities, goals are, and then say no to anything that just doesn't align with that. Mm. Um, set boundaries, obviously, very much needed. I really love the way this article talked about setting boundaries, though. They said that setting boundaries, you can think about it as an outward expression of self-love. Isn't outward that so nice? expression of self-love. I like that. Yeah, I really me too. Like I really that. love that. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Um, and then I tacked on to that. It also helps keep resentment at bay. Mm, because right. you're viewing it in a positive way. Mm -hmm. You're, you, you're mm -hmm. viewing boundaries as not how the other person will view it, but how you view it for yourself, which is self-love. Yeah. Like yeah, reframing absolutely. how you think about boundaries. I really, really like that. That's awesome. Exactly. And it, it's kind of like two sides to the same coin, right? I mean, at the end of the day, both of those things are true. Right. But you get to choose which coin you're looking at, which side of it. <laughs> right. Right. Reframing. Yeah. Exactly. Um, something else that you can do to stop people pleasing? Question if you're being manipulated through guilt or flattery. Mm -hmm. You know, that could happen, right? Some people can take advantage of your inability to say no and, you know, just kind of like take, take, take without giving. Mm -hmm. So being able to recognize who's doing that and who's not doing that in the spectrum of like people pleasing isn't bad, that you should figure out where you want to fall. Ideally, most of us don't want to be people pleasing towards people who are manipulating us. We would maybe be right. okay with people who are more reciprocal. Yeah. Um, 
Another thing is setting a time limit so you don't give away too much of your time and energy. For example, if you don't want to talk on the phone, but someone's calling you, you know, saying something like, hey, I'm about to go out the door in like 10 minutes. So, you know, like setting that time limit of this is how much time I have right now. It's kind of a boundary, right? Essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I really like this one. The One of the tips was have like an empowering affirmation that you just like repeat to yourself. And I, I jotted down a few that I really liked. One okay. of them, you know, the simple basic, I'm allowed to say no. Makes sense, right? Yes. The other one was not my circus, not my monkeys. <laughs> oh, I've heard that a lot, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I'm, no I'm allowed to say no. I'm allowed to say no. Not my circus, not my monkey. Mm -hmm, okay. Exactly. And this last one, it really resonated with me. And it was, I'm the guardian of my time and my energy. Wow. I'm powerful the guardian stuff. of my time and my energy. So yeah. powerful. I like it. I know. I love that so much. I read that and I was like, oh my God, I, this is going to be one of my new affirmations. I am yes. the guardian of my time and energy. Yes. I love that. Me too. Um, other things. So the other tip was say no. Simple, right? It's a boundary, but also like simplified into just say no. Like if you don't want to do something or if you're asked to give something or, you know, whatever it is, it's like just say no. And if saying mm -hmm. no, which is definitely okay to say, doesn't feel good yet, you can try something like, I'm not going to be able to make it to that. Or unfortunately, I'm at my capacity. I can't handle that. Or I'm mm -hmm. honored, but I don't have the time to dedicate to that that it deserves. Or I have plans then, but thank you for thinking of me. You know, like get yeah. creative with saying no if just saying no doesn't feel, you know, right. not your style. That's okay. Yeah. But there are other ways to say no without saying no. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, this one in particular, this tip that I'm about to share now, this has helped me immensely in my recovering people-pleasing stuff, which is okay. ask for time. If you can't in the moment say no to somebody – then just say, let me get back to you. Or I don't have my calendar. Let me go home, check and get back to you. Um, and, you know, use a friend, a family member or a partner as an excuse too. I got to check with this person and then I'll get back to yeah. you. I might have plans already with them. You know, like that's yeah. okay. But asking for time has been a really big one that's helped me not people please in the moment. Because like in the yes. moment, you're just like flooded with that guilt or the mm -hmm. thought of I have to people mm -hmm. please right now. They're going to be so disappointed. All of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're almost to the end. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> the next tip was mine. I added this to the list, which was sit with the discomfort and regulate. You know, a lot of the things that happen in life can bring about a lot of discomfort for us. But yes. the thing is, discomfort is unavoidable. So the sooner we can sit in our discomfort, make it more comfortable, the sooner we can not let it take so much you know, control mm -hmm. over us. Normalize the discomfort we feel in that situation. Yeah, yes. exactly. Become aware of it and accept it and embrace it. Exactly. Give it a hug. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Exactly. Yeah. You know, being uncomfortable, you have to know when it's inappropriate and not okay to be uncomfortable. For example, if your safety is involved and when some discomfort, like just being afraid of other people's perceptions of you or you know things like that like those we can sit in and we can make that more comfortable we can regulate ourselves um and the last three that i'll list out were um if it's not your fault replace your i'm sorry with something like oh that's a bummer or that sucks instead of like over apologizing for things that aren't right. even your fault yes i'm definitely very guilty of that like when i'm setting boundaries <laughs> i still apologize Till you know, yeah, still working. Yeah. So those are good tips. Yeah, and the last two are pretty quick ones. One of them is positive self talk. So kind of like the you know affirmations. A positive self talk is all about saying things that are affirming to self, like I'm lovable mm -hmm. for being, not doing. Right, like I'm lovable for just being, existing. I don't need to do anything to be lovable. I love that so much. <laughs> I love that a lot. That resonates yeah. for me with me. I've never heard that. I'm gonna before. say that one more time. Oh. I'm gonna say it one more time. Sit in it, breathe in it. Okay. Ready? Okay. I'm lovable for being, not doing. I'm lovable for being and not doing. My actions yes. are not the should not be the result of other people's love. 
Yeah. There's another one. Exactly. <laughs> this is that one. Love it. I love it. On the, on the hand. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. And the last one was to celebrate any and all small wins. So I kind of added on to that. Basically, the way I saw it as any movement, any progress is still progress. So just keep right. moving the needle little by little. Maybe you can't do all of the things that I just listed out, but maybe you just start doing like one thing, two things. Right. Any like little movement is still movement in the right direction. And we can yes. do it. We can replace our people pleasing. We can become recovered people pleasers, even if we struggle, which I yes. definitely still do. But we're working yeah. on it. <laughs> yeah. So anything that you can think of that you can add that helped you in your journey to like recover from this people pleasing? I mean, I'm still a recovering people pleaser, but I think something that I really wanted to emphasize was once you're in that stage, like once in, and I'll talk about this in a little bit too in my experience, yeah. in my story, but once you are in the stage and when you realize like, oh, this people pleasing that I'm doing might not be healthy for my mental health and well-being, mm -hmm. there's like that other self, like another set of guilt that can come in like, oh, I need to change this fast. Like this is not good for me. Like, yeah, you know, the like, it's just like another set, feeling of guilt can creep in and say like, oh, why, why aren't you getting better right away? Why aren't you doing that? And if things really important to, like you mentioned, like progress is really important. That's a big step, right? Realizing, but then also like sitting with that and saying like, okay, mm -hmm. I've realized this of what's going, like I re made this realization. And now that I know, like I'm going to take baby steps to move in the direction that I want. And yeah. being this way, is not not my fault. That was like the biggest thing. Like because yeah. I didn't agree, like once I realized like, oh, like people pleasing, like the far end of the spectrum is not healthy for me. Mm -hmm. I also had to tell myself like I shouldn't be at blame for the way I am. Right. right? Like, we talked about the origins, like it comes in many different situations and experiences. Yeah. And so it's really important because it's so easy to like blame your situation mm. on yourself because that's what you like it's your situation right it's mine, going yeah. on with you exactly um, i think that's like one of the biggest things that helped me and is helping me in my journey is that i have to not blame myself and get upset mm -hmm. i love that that's such a good point i hadn't even thought about that but that's so true you know the, that's one of the first things actually i think i read but i didn't include i was like oh i don't need to include this but that's so true like being gentle with yourself and recognizing like hey i might be doing this but like it's okay like there's a reason mm -hmm. i'm doing this i either mm -hmm. learned it somewhere or i needed to do it and it served me in the past or like whatever the reason is just being like kind to yourself and being because right. like for example i know for a fact if i had come to you and said i can't believe i'm people pleasing like i feel so bad how could i have done this to myself mm -hmm. you'd have been like stop that's great you're totally <laughs> fine it's not your fault like yeah. you would be the first person to be like, don't blame yourself. But it, you know, it's different when it's about ourselves. We're quicker to blame. Right. right. And people pleasing already point. has so much complexities when it comes to blaming yourself. Like if you're, yeah. if you're a people pleaser and you're not people pleasing, you're already feeling guilty for not people pleasing. But then once <laughs> exactly. you realize that people pleasing is not healthy, like that extreme, like then you're feeling guilty that you're doing it. Right. So there's just so many <laughs> layers and yeah. there's just, you know, any any progress is progress, even if it's just sitting with it and realizing like, okay, yeah, this is this is what I need to do. And it's not my fault. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Even awareness before you act on it is progress. 100%. Right. Right. Exactly. Okay. Well, let's talk for about um, how this people pleasing shows up in South Asian culture. Okay. Ready? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So I've got a couple different things. Um, I'll start with this one. So I read an article by mm, Shaista Khan, who okay. wrote her article on basically like how South Asia's colonial legacy impacts mental health and well-being. And basically mm -hmm. to summarize, she basically says that the legacy of colonial era oppression it's visible amongst the South Asian community in behaviors like inferiority complexes, submissiveness people-pleasing, and overachieving tendencies. Mm -hmm. And she goes on to say, like, later in this article about someone um, that she had interviewed, that to break this intergenerational trauma cycle, one of the Indian authors that was quoted in the article practices mindfulness, assertiveness, okay. 
which Ooh. assertiveness is a form of how boundaries can be communicated. So right. AKA assertive communication and boundaries. Um, right. And using collaborative approach at work to kind of break up this people pleasing tendency and like kind of deferring to authority figures and things like that. And I, I thought that was a good quick summary of like, one, this goes so far back into not just like, like I said, right, prehistoric time and era, but also, you know, colonial times. And it, mm -hmm. it does have an impact for so many generations that this is something that right. we just passed down generationally. Mm -hmm. So this isn't like, if you think about it, this isn't just our experiences we're breaking. We're breaking intergenerational traumas and cycles and like history. So it is hard. Right. All the more reason to be gentle with ourselves, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's way deeper and goes back way further than we realize. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and then I found this other article that I thought was a wonderful example of showing how, like, it can show up in, like, just kind of day-to-day -day South Asian culture. Okay. So I forgot to put down the title, unfortunately, of the article, but it's a personal finance um, insider article written okay. by Parveen Munder. She is okay. a millennial money coach. And okay. I'm going to read straight from, like, a paragraph of what she said. So in her article, okay. she talks about how we use money as a way to people please so that whenever our parents ask us for money or we're told to send money to a random relative back in India, we'll comply even if it hurts us financially. And I hadn't even like thought about like financial repercussions and like how that can even show up for us in like, you know, people pleasing ways, but it's so true. And like yeah. it'll highlight in this next um, quote I'm going to tell you, which is by Natasha um, she's a founder of Purpose and Try. And in that same article, okay. she goes on to say it becomes a standard to try and pick up the bill, even when I knew I couldn't afford to, because this was something I'd seen up front and center in South Asian culture. I yeah, footed the bill for family members for things like car payments, eating out, shopping expenses, and buying gifts when I wasn't in a position to. I think a lot of it was centered around the idea of people pleasing and trying to ensure others were happy even if I was doing so at the detriment of my own finances. She goes on to add, many of these financial decisions were often based on guilt. Mm. Yeah. This is really powerful. I had never thought about this aspect of South Asian culture, but it's so prevalent and so relevant about, like, it makes sense. Like, I've seen this. I've done it, yeah. right? Like, yeah. It's so, it makes sense. My You've done it like, with me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but but no I have really done it though. with you lol yeah you have at agas <laughs> yeah Ooh, yummy agas <laughs> but it's it's such like a normal part of our culture though like right. we don't think about it when somebody visits us for the first time like we pay for them when they visit us you know like right even if like maybe oh it's like oh i didn't get paid a lot this month and like it doesn't matter you don't think about all that you just think like this is the normal this is the tradition this right. is the culture this is what's expected and yes. like it brings up such a good point but i've never stopped to even like question that right me neither it's eye-opening so deeply embedded yes <laughs> yes um there's probably so much more that we haven't realized now that i think about oh it. i would not be surprised yeah <laughs> Um, and then there were two other things that I was kind of just thinking on and like adding to it. And those two things were transactional love or, you know, as you mm -hmm. had said earlier, right, conditional love and then collectivist mm -hmm. culture. So on the collectivist culture side, you know, as we've talked about several times already, collectivist culture is all about the collective rather than the individual. And South Asian culture is very much collectivist culture. So the needs of the family, elders, they are more of a party than individuals. At least that's right. what's, you know, that's how it's portrayed and like, you know, mm -hmm. all of that. And then the other piece that I was, you know, reflecting on was the transactional love part of it, right? And this can show up with like chores. It can show up with like, academic accomplishments, supporting like maybe your siblings or like taking care of them from like more of a parental role, mm -hmm. getting into a good school, getting into a good, like doing a good major. 
Yes. A couple of acceptable ones. <laughs> mm, Getting right. a good, you know, prestigious job, marrying the quote unquote right person, having mm -hmm. kids, you know, all of these things are ways to show this love, but they're conditional if you think about it. Because if you don't do it, you may or may not you get, get the questioned. Love. Right? You yeah. get questioned. Definitely right. push back. They may mm -hmm. or may not accept it. They may or may not love it. Right. Right. Hence, it's transactional. Hence, naturally, we want to work towards their love because at the end of the day, they're like our parents. Right. And we're always going to want to strive towards receiving that love from them. And so that's kind of embedding like all of these different ways how they can, quote unquote, control us and, you know, try and ensure that we do what they want us to do. Or fulfill their expectations mm -hmm. because we want to please them so they love us so right. we feel accepted by them right yeah these are the different kinds of ways that i looked up and thought about how it shows up in our culture but i'm sure there are yeah. lots of other ways that i haven't mentioned yes. can you think of anything like out of the top of your head that you reflected on i'm just like just thinking of like reflection of all the interactions i've had and i just like just had this I'm just like thinking I don't I'm sure it's not generalized but I just with my experience like there's just the people pleasing yeah. tendencies are so so prevalent in the female of the household the mothers the grandmothers yeah the, you know the older siblings like if, if, like you know and it's so embedded in the culture like yeah the, you know the wife the mother has yeah. to stop working or stop studying because she's getting married or because she's mm -hmm. having a child she has to take care of that child mm -hmm. right like i've heard i've talked to so many people that are like you know my mom's age where they gave up their dream career mm -hmm. or whatever they wanted to do because they got married because they had a family to raise which mm -hmm. is another form of people pleasing and yeah i'm not trying to say like you know you know the the males of the household don't people please but i'm just in my experience right. i'm saying like i have seen it, it more prevalent in the females of the household right. like they're they're giving up their mental health you know not like they're anxious feeling anxious a lot about making sure the husband's happy the in-laws are happy mm -hmm. and it's just so like like you said it's intergenerational but it's like embedded in the culture like it's an expectation yeah. to people please right which is an so expectation and praised <laughs> and reinforced, right? It's reinforced. Exactly. Like the husband will be happy with the wife if the wife has cleaned the house, cooked rotis, and like taken care of the kids, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. I, like, I don't know. Like, I haven't experienced this myself, right? But I don't know, like, right? That love could be a transactional too between the husband and wife. That when sure. the wife, you know, people pleases, that's how the male partner is providing the, his love right and if that is the case you know I, I would pretty much be willing to bet like that's something that they've probably seen too you know in their parents and like just kind of seeing this as very normal very expected very you know this is just how it is kind of perspective right and yeah. i'm not saying like you know i've seen that i've seen it with like kids too right like the the, mm -hmm. the parent pleasing, right? When you're sure. the son or the daughter, like you have to please your parents no matter what. Like you have to let go of what you're doing, let go of your mental health. Like it's just another expectation of children too that I've noticed mm -hmm. is that you yeah. are parent pleasing. You have to be parent pleasers. Like it's just yeah. embedded when you were young. Um, yeah. That's what I've kind of experienced and noticed and observed. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as we've already talked about, right, like authoritarian style of parenting is huge for most South Asians, mm -hmm. which definitely lends itself to this like people pleasing tendencies because that love is withheld. It is transactional. Right. So right. you do want it. And then you have to like you're again, like survival coping mechanism. You're taught teaching yourself and taught through their praise that you should do that. Right. That's how you receive that love. Yeah. Yes. But having said all of what we talked about, like I said, this is a evolutionary skill. Therefore, there's nothing wrong with having it. It's about finding that balance, finding that um, right. The 
yeah, the, the balance in that spectrum, right? So I, I think mm-hmm. that it's always good for us to be able to like check in and ask ourselves like, where do we fall on this spectrum? Mm-hmm. And like, right, am I exhibiting healthy people pleasing? Or am I maybe doing a little bit too much people pleasing that maybe, maybe it's time to question if I need to? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was a very educational part. <laughs> I feel like that's all I had educationally. That was a lot, wasn't it? <laughs> all right. So let's jump to my story. Yes, I'm ready. All right. So my story is pretty simple-ish. Essentially, growing up, I saw both of my parents, primarily my mom, but both of my parents being huge people pleasers. Mm -hmm. Mom was the epitome of self-sacrificial. She literally was constantly thinking about other people. She was literally constantly thinking about how she can serve somebody, accommodate somebody. And like, I would see it all the time, but in like particular day-to-day examples, for example, that like really stuck with me when it came to food, you know, as we've talked about, oh, as we've not talked about yet, I'm not gonna get into that, but you know, food (laughs) is a way that they express love, right? And um, she would always do this thing where like, if there was, I don't know, like a sweet or like some curry or something, she would be like, okay, I'm going to give it to you and you and you and then last me. Like she always mm. put herself last. And yeah. if there was like one sweet and she really like that was her favorite thing, she would take the smallest bite and then leave everybody else like huge pieces. Yeah. Just so self-sacrificial. And like I saw this too like with um, like belongings, accessories, you know, just random things. Right. If somebody says, oh, that's really cute. Can I borrow that? Or – Oh, that's so cute. I would love that. Like, she would just be like, all right, you want it? And like that blew my mind. She would just be like, you want it? What? Yeah. Again, very Mm self-sacrificial. I also saw that with, like, her time and energy. Like, she'll go out of her way to be helpful or accommodating Mm -hmm. um, for somebody. And that's the part, like, that I definitely saw resonating with dad as well. Um, Dad wasn't as self-sacrificial as mom, but he was in certain ways. and two of the ways one time and energy and money dad was definitely Mm. growing up like i saw he was very very like giving and like very like like take a bunch right (laughs) um but also with his time and energy like he would go out of his way to like maybe drive people or Mm -hmm. you know drop and pick people up from the airport you know just like little examples but even he was pretty much accommodating of others i would say yeah um comparatively though i felt like dad had a little bit more of a balance mom on the other hand was definitely a huge people pleaser but the thing about that was they just like they never resented like it didn't come off as like oh i can't believe i have to do this like it was so genuine coming from them they wanted to do it but it wasn't my experience. So for the longest time, I kept beating myself about it because I was like, when I self-sacrifice in this way, like I was okay with it for sometimes here and there. Sure. Yeah. But there were times where I'd be like, I don't want to do this. Like, why am mm-hmm. I doing this? And then feeling yeah. really bad about myself and like being really critical of myself being like, look how happy like mom and dad are. They would never think this. Like, how could you do- think this about yourself? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, like that, that always created a lot of friction point for me. And even now it's still pretty puzzling to me, but I've accepted it as like, all right, that's just them. If they're okay with it, they're okay with it. I'm yeah. not. Um, but obviously like seeing both of my parents being so like people pleasing and like self-sacrificial, like it was just so glorified and like seen as desirable, even for me as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, that I obviously definitely did that a lot. Yeah. I mean, and that's what you were exposed to, right? Yeah. That's what it was and modeled like, for you. It was modeled for me, exactly. And so I did that. And for a really long time, actually, that was pretty much a like a huge like badge of honor for me. You know, because I was labeled as like, oh, Wanusha's like that sweet, nice kid. She's such a good girl. She's so thoughtful. And like it wasn't just positive reinforcement for everybody else that made me feel good, but like growing up, my mom wasn't very much affectionate like super affectionate 
She wasn't really touchy feely. Mm -hmm. She wasn't really big on praise. But in moments like that, when I was self sacrificial, whether she saw it or whether somebody else saw it and praised me, like she would be affectionate, mm -hmm. like she would be praising. And so, like, it created this dynamic of like, this is definitely good. You definitely need to do this. Yeah. Um, but like I said, because I didn't exactly it didn't really come from the bottom of my heart all the time it came from an urge a need to do it that often left me kind of angry resentful especially towards certain people who like took advantage mm -hmm. of that inability to say no took advantage of that giving nature um and you know as i talked about i went through a very angry phase in my life and coming out of that i realized it's okay to be, you know, quote unquote, a little selfish. It's okay yes. to, you know, say no and then give when you genuinely want to give and then don't right. when you don't want to. Because right. at the end of the day, the only person that's going to end up hurting is you because you'll give it to them if you didn't want to give it to them, right? Then they're happy because you gave it to them, but you're mm -hmm. not. So mm -hmm. it's only hurting you. Right. Right. Um, and of course, I say all of this. I am not perfect. I am a recovering people pleaser and I will continue to be for the rest of my life. It is not <laughs> something that you just like, boom, chapter close, we're done here. Yes. Right? It's something that's it's, hard. It's complex. It's constant. It's ge intergenerational. Yeah. Like, and you mentioned in your story too, like, you know, it's yeah. modeled for you for years, like when you grew up in your household. Mm -hmm. And so breaking that cycle looks like breaking the cycle, but not necessarily never having to deal with that. <laughs> Right, right. But some of the things that do help me deal with it is realizing, you know, exactly what I said earlier, like, that it just hurts me. And so if it just hurts me, then I am the one holding anger. I am the one holding resentment. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. need to do that. That's such an energy drain. And it ruins the relationship. So instead, saying no yes. is just safer. It's better for me. Yes. It's better for the relationship. Yes. Um. And not quite as eloquent as the amazing affirmation, the affirmation, not my circus, mm -hmm. not my monkeys, right? but essentially like recognizing that I'm responsible for taking care of me and that's it. Right. And another big thing that helped me, like I said earlier, was like delaying my answers so that if I didn't want to say no, but I felt pressured, I can wait. I can think about it genuinely, figure out like, is this something I'm okay being pushed around? Is this something I that's really don't want strategy. to that I'll regret? And then deciding. Um, and I think that one really has been like ultimately the biggest and like most helpful thing for me personally. Yeah. Yeah. I've done that before. Second. Like, like yeah. you know, delaying my answer. I think I started yeah. to naturally do that to protect my people. Like, you know, stop being yeah. myself from being a people pleaser. Exactly. It's so helpful. It's such a useful tool, I think. It is. The second thing, like basically a runner up to that one is recognizing that my guilt, it might come up for me, but it doesn't mean that I have anything to be guilty for. Guilt right. sometimes just comes up because it's like your moral compass. It's saying, hey, are we making value-led decisions right now? And like, all you have to say is yes or no. And if the answer is yes, then okay, just let guilt exist. Sit in that discomfort and let it be okay that it's there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong. Right, right. Yeah. I like that, asking that question to yourself. Yeah. And the last thing is um, setting boundaries, like I said, right? I'm, you know, I already love boundaries. I've had quite a struggle with that, you know, <laughs> as I've shared many times, but boundaries certainly have helped me recognize, in addition to all of the other things I've talked about, that it helps me protect my peace. It helps me yes. maintain my relationships without feeling a little resentful and right. without avoiding people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's my story yeah that all makes sense to me yeah so that's it for my story okay i'm ready to hear yours okay you ready i'm ready Ooh. this is a big <laughs> one <laughs> yeah. i like i think just like the last episode the overthinking topic that we did this mm -hmm. one i think both really 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 resonate with me they're pretty like heavy for me just because yeah. like I would say like people pleasing is something that 
I'll get into it, but like it's because it became like part of my identity pretty much. Mm. And I'm still, you know, undoing it. I'm still recovering. I'm still catching myself. Um, as you know, we've talked about like I'm in the middle of wedding planning. So like it's come up a lot within my family, within me. And just like setting boundaries is really sometimes can be hard because mm-hmm. it is going against the people pleasing tendencies that I have and I share. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But I know like we talked about the origin. So, and I like, like my origin is very like similar to yours too. I, in, in, a, in a way, right? Both my parents are people pleasers. They were very self sacrificial. Whether that meant like my mom, you know, giving up working. She was, she thankfully was able to not give up her dream of doing the career she wants, which is a nurse. Yeah. But, you know, when it came to having a social life or doing your own hobbies, like she definitely gave up all of that to like people please the mm. family and her kids. Yeah. Um, same thing with my dad, like time and money. That was something that he also did people pleasing with. We were, we, my parents live in a city where we have a lot of family members that are around, especially my dad's side of the family. So like my dad mm. is, like, is an engineer. So like, he's a, you know, very good with like handy things and things that need to be fixed or like, he's very analytical. And so he would like sacrifice his time when it came to spending time with, you know, the family, like my mom and my, me and my sister to like, serve others, like serve his family, like whether that's like helping fix something in the house or, or doing a task for them. Um, Mm. So that definitely was modeled for me growing up. Yeah. And I've talked about this in our first episode, the attachment episode where I dove into my attachment style and how that anxious style attachment that I developed at a young age made me feel that my parents' love was transactional. It was conditional. And then the people pleasing was my protective factor in that when I would people, when I parent pleased, right? When I made sure my parents were happy with me or I did something to make them happy, that's when Mm. I received that praise like you you mentioned in your story or that's when I received the love that I really craved. Um, So it was continuously reinforced. And then of and then I talked about how when I didn't please them or cause them to be upset, I didn't receive the same amount of love or any love, right? I just got anger or, you know, silent treatment. Um, yeah. And it just led to me be a people pleaser, a parent pleaser, which eventually led me to a people pleaser. And that role mm-hmm. took over my identity. That's how I thought I would develop and maintain friendships. I became a people pleaser to make sure I received good grades, good treatment in school, being the teacher's pet, right? You know about this, being well liked by mm. everyone, became op- op- important to me, becoming an yeah. overachiever, doing the best thing I can for myself, even that that means like I'm losing sleep at night or I'm not taking care of myself. That like just became a priority for me. People pleasing mm. became a priority. And it was positively reinforced. I think when it comes to like achievement and, you know, academics and career, people pleasing is reinforced, right? Mm -hmm. And so in every aspect of my life, people pleasing was becoming positively reinforced. And so it just, it was just like a rolling ball. Like I just kept on going, like I kept on doing it. And this people pleaser in me led to be the more giver, the, the, the giver in the relationships. Um, and so I was always willing to give and give, go the extra mile for the people that I care about. And of course, I, st- you know, I still want to, but it was always to the extent of my own, like sacrificing my own well-being or mental health. And mm-hmm. I would say like, it's actually very recent where I, where I want to say like within the last year and a half to two years, I realized that this is the ten- this is not healthy. Um, so it's pretty recent to my wake up mm. call. And so yeah. I'm still, you know, reflecting and recovering. And as I started therapy and reflecting on my experiences, I became aware of how people pleasing can be dangerous too. And I think mm. I noticed, and I still notice till this day, I'm still working because it's so deeply rooted, is that the people pleasing is the most unhealthy for me. So it's the furthest in the in the spectrum for me with friendships. Oh. And yeah, I like would drop everything I am doing to spend time with friends, answer that text or call from that one friend, like no matter what yeah. I'm doing. Like one, t- this is kind of embarrassing, but it's true. Like one time I was literally mm. in the shower 
and I noticed a friend mm. called me, I like stopped my shower and stepped out <laughs> and answered. Like I, yeah. I was like, remember, I was like, what am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? <laughs> and mm. I had to tell myself like, it's okay to set boundaries. And I like would try to reflect like, why am I doing this? And I think it goes back to like how my friendships were reinforced when I, were, when I was younger. Like I didn't have the most healthy friendships. And mm. I always tied like people pleasing or pleasing my friends to like, okay, they're going to stay my friends. And so that fear of rejection, fear of abandon was in play. And mm-hmm. I had to tell myself like that I don't have to make them happy all the time. And that like, if I don't make them happy all the time or go what their preference is, they won't leave me. Like I had to like tell myself that. And mm. It, I mean, I'm still, I still struggle with it, but it's there, you know, like I had to really do affirmations. I had to reflect in therapy. I had to do a lot of self-reflection and figuring out like, okay, my the friends, true friends love is not transactional. It's not mm-hmm. conventional. Uh, mm-hmm. And so maybe it was like a part of me too, where I feared like, okay, like if I stop people pleasing, I'll realize who my true friends are, right? Like almost that way too. Like I didn't want to be confronted by the truth. Um, Yeah. And I want to say like, this is something that I talked about, right? Already, like I observe in the household. Um, My, I would say my mom, more so my dad also is a bigger people pleaser. Mm. And you know, with wedding planning happening, just like small things are coming up, we're making decisions and even decisions that should be like only between like my parents, me and my sister, like she's immediately Mm -hmm. like overthinking and saying like, oh my gosh, we have to be careful about not making this person upset or this family upset, this family member upset. Mm -hmm. And so I'm catching that now, now that I'm like reflecting and catching myself, like I'm catching my mom's people (laughs) thinking tendencies, which is so interesting. Like I'm, last time I went home, like I noticed that and I had to like, you know, in the past, like I would kind of go overthink with herself, with my, with her, or like I would kind of get upset in the moment. Like, why are you thinking that way? Like mm-hmm. I would kind of dismiss it. But now that I yeah. know like it's her people pleasing tendency too, like I told her calmly, mm-hmm. like that it's our family of the wedding and you know, we get to make our own decisions no matter what. Yes. Like, you know, it, even if they get upset, like what is that going to do? Like, yeah, like yeah. they might say something, but that's it, right? Like, they're going to forget about it the next couple of weeks or next day. Um, yeah. So she was actually receptive. And like she even said like ah, – I love that. Like she was like, I don't know. I was like, why are you overthinking? Like, you know, it's my wedding. Like we don't – like we should be the ones that we should be caring about who's happy, like not mm-hmm. them. And she even said it. She was like, mm-hmm. I don't know why I'm thinking. I'm just like that. And as soon as she said <laughs> oh. that, I was like oh, – that's a relevant revelation, right? Like she's reflecting herself. <laughs> yeah. Like that's so much progress for her. That. So I was like so happy yeah. inside. I was like, oh my God, she's like realizing that, okay, like she's like that and not yeah. like, you know, of course Wait, I don't want it okay, to be pause blame, real quick. blaming. Do you realize that you going to therapy, you confronting <laughs> your people pleasing has created a way for not only you to break this cycle, but to like yes. for auntie to see it yes. and like confront it too in her own way. I know. It's, it's amazing. Big. It's big. It's That's big. That's huge. Yeah. Oh, I'm huge. so proud of you. I'm proud of auntie. <laughs> yes, I'm so proud of her. Like that's still big progress. Like I don't want her to blame herself, of course. Yeah. But that's like she's reflecting on it. Um, and I think therapy yeah. has really helped me reframe how my parents act and behave. So I'm not – I don't have the same reactions anymore, right? I'm understanding the yeah. origins of their behavior, which is helping me right. keep a calm demeanor or understand where they're coming from, but also yeah. set boundaries and give my own point of view, which yes, has been really helpful. I love that. Yeah, which Go has been Michelle. really helpful. Yes, thank you. Um, you out here killing it. <laughs> Yes, I know. But not always. I'm telling you with friendships, it's still a struggle. Um, like I'm killing it with my parents. I'm sh- like, you know, I feel like, but again, right? Like there, there's that blood relation. Like I know my parents are still going to be there at the end of the day. So it's easier for right. me to like, in a way, it's easier for mm. me to set boundaries because that's how my brain works, how I think. And I'm sure like, that might sure. not be the case for others. But like with friendships, yeah. like it's just yeah. that, like it's just a relationship. And and I, that's what I struggle with is that if I don't please my friends, like they're going to leave me. And mm. like, I'm just like trying to reflect too, like where 
I think there was like certain instances when I was in kindergarten, first grade or second grade where like a really good friend of mm-hmm. mine moved to like Pakistan and like mm-hmm. I was just really upset about that. Like it was my first best friend <laughs> or yeah. like I think I mentioned this in a previous episode where like there was like a best friend I had and then another best friend like joined class late and then them two like went off. And so maybe mm. like little Michelle thought like I wasn't people pleasing enough. So when I started, maybe when I started mm. people pleasing them more, like they started giving me more attention more. So like I yeah. associated that with friendships too. Still like yeah. pointing like finger, like, you know, I can't put my finger on it exactly still. I'm still thinking, but mm. it is something that I feel uneasy with when it comes to people, like when I feel like I made a mistake or I said something, even if I set a boundary with a friend, like I'm overthinking. Or I'm just constant, like I'm fearing overwhelmed, like all those things that you mentioned. Like I was like, yep, I feel, I mm-hmm. felt that. I feel guilt, feel you know, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes resentment, or all the feelings that that me- that you mentioned about talking when you mentioned like the signs of people pleasing. I feel like that's mm-hmm. very very prevalent, with, in, especially yeah. in my friendships, like the unhealthy side. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like, like. I can tell like even now that I'm starting to learn, like I have my own time and energy I need to protect. I need to set boundaries. Mm -hmm. And when I do, like I'm thinking, I'm catastrophizing, I'm worrying that I'll ruin Mm -hmm. the relationship. But it is a work in progress. And you're right. Work in progress. You know, there's – I have to focus on what I've done so far and I'm going to keep moving baby steps in the right direction. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, you bring up a good point too, you know, people pleasing, just like it's on a spectrum. It's not a generalized thing. There might be some Mm -hmm. areas of our life we're better about people pleasing, being more balanced in some areas of our life that we just naturally struggle with more. And right. It's okay. They're their own separate journeys and like they can come along at their own paces. It's okay. Yeah. Hmm. It's so interesting though. You know, earlier you said that even like when you you know when you were growing up you saw that your dad was self-sacrificial with time and money your mom was a bit more self-sacrificial with like just kind of everything isn't it interesting like our moms were Mm self-sacrificial when it came to personal things careers or hobbies or like just personal things but with dads it was more time and money that just seems so interesting to me i wonder if that's a bit more common with you know everyone else like in their experiences Mm -hmm. like south asian men tend to be more time and money self-sacrificing but not personal and if women right. tend to be more personal oriented like that's i wonder that's so interesting. I, wonder. I wonder if that's a pattern right yeah yeah I, I think that people need to like whoever's listening to this if you have thoughts on this your experiences would really yes. love to hear about it Please share. I'm, I'm curious now yeah yes, yes. um and you know as you're sharing there were these like two really vivid examples of my life that just kind of flashed before my eyes things yeah. i'd forgotten i really want to share they're kind of funny yeah I want now to hear. they're funny they were very horrifying when it was happening horrifying as an embarrassing <laughs> when you were talking about being a teacher's pet i vividly remembered <laughs> in fourth grade i had this amazing sweet teacher miss martinez uh-huh. and during one of our like in between class period breaks a bunch of like literally the entire class for some reason got up to go to the restroom Mm-hmm. And I have no idea what possessed us in that moment, but we kind of sort of as a class trashed the restrooms a little bit, just slightly. Wow. Not sure why. <laughs> Not sure why. And then we come back to sit down, all of us into our seats, and Miss Martinez goes, like, what the heck happened? Like, raise your hand. Who all had any part to play in this? Guess what? Guess what? I was the only yeah. one who raised my hand. Oh... <laughs> <laughs> little me i have no idea why was like very sincerely just raising my hand nobody else in the ca- class raised her hand yeah nobody else and she was i like i was just thinking like oh my god i was such a people pleaser that the minute mm-hmm. an authority figure especially like a teacher i really loved was like okay everybody did really bad tell me who did it i was like okay i'll, I'll, I'll confess I, I was i played a part and like nobody else did and i was thinking like This has got to be related to my people pleasing issues. Right, right, right. (laughs) Never made that connection, but it always makes like uh, Avi, he always cracks up when he thinks about it. He's like, wow, you were such a nerd. (laughs) That's so funny. (laughs) Now, Michelle, now it's funny. Then it was very embarrassing. I was like, the rest of the class eventually like confessed too, or was it just you? 
Wow. So did you no, get in trouble? No, it was all crickets. Did you get in trouble? I feel like I can't remember if we all got in trouble or if I got in less trouble or I don't remember what ended up happening, to be honest. Okay. But she did call me out and she was like, oh, so is Anusha the only one who trashed oh, everything? Okay, at least Thank you, God, Anusha, for raising your hands. You. Gotcha. Yeah. So she knew you were a teacher's pet. <laughs> yeah, she was clearly like, mm, that's why you're my favorite. And I was like, don't, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and something yeah. else that I remember from the teacher. What did you say, Michelle? I said a teacher pet stays the good old days, you know. Mm. <laughs> good old days. <laughs> When we were so left right. out of our people-pleasing tendencies. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. That just popped in my head and I had to share. <laughs> I thought it was no, the craziest thing did. to remember. Very I'm random. I imagine this. Yes. Little Anusha wing. <laughs> I know. I was literally, I was literally just like, I didn't even hesitate. That's the thing. I literally, she said, raise your Aww. hand if you played a part. And I immediately was like, okay, I did. I looked around and I was like, oh, shit. That's so my funny. Hand <laughs> so funny. <laughs> mm. Well, shall we wrap up our story today? I feel like we had a yes. really long story time. Yes. So if anything resonated with you or if you would like to share your thoughts or any feedback, you could reach us at our email, talksouthasiantome at gmail.com or Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Our handle is at talksouthasiantome. And thank you for everybody who has supported us so far and our listeners. We appreciate you all. <laughs> all right. Catch you awesome. at the next episode. Bye, everyone. Woohoo. Bye. I love the woohoos at the end. <laughs> <laughs>